I'm going to be sharing tonight in an introduction to the seminar to help us better understand why we do the things we do, why we say the things we say. Um, it's very important that you and I believe, first and foremost, that we can change, that we don't have to be the same as we've always been. We're going to be getting into about how words can affect your life, how words can defect, affect your attitude. One, two, okay. Just down a little bit. How words can affect your attitude. A little, uh, still getting a little echo. A little down more. Down, 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 down. All right, that's good. How words can affect your attitude. How words can affect the person that you're with. How words can either heal or words can destroy. And a lot of times it's not really what we say, but it's how we say it. I mean, you can have factual proof of, of truth and say it the wrong way. So that rather than having a positive outcome of what you're saying, it actually is reversed and has a negative effect. So I want you to open up your Bibles tonight. I'm going to share some scriptures with you. In this introduction, we're not going to get really into the seminar till next week. But this is just the introduction in Psalm 147. This is, a, this is something that you have to come to grips with first and foremost in this seminar. You have to be convinced I can't convince you. No one can convince you. But you have to be convinced that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Many of us, at different levels in our life and different occasions and things through our life, have been through some really difficult situations and circumstances. Some of us has, have gone really through uh, some things that others have not gone through. Those things that you've gone through and those situations that you came out of either has a positive effect on you or a negative effect. It all depends on how much of those things that you've gone through and the things that people have spoken into your life about you, what you believe. If you believe what they said about you, and you keep getting all of those things in your life, that negativity in your life, then you will become those things if you believe them. The Bible says in Proverbs, as a, I believe it's Proverbs, it says, as a man thinketh, or a woman thinketh, so is he or she. So what you think has a very positive effect on who you become in life. The people you associate with, the people you hang around with, that has all to do with what you believe about yourself. You have to believe in order for this seminar to be effective in your life. You have to believe that God wants to heal the brokenhearted. He wants to bind up the wounds. And some of those uh, heartbreaks and some of those wounds can be very, very, very difficult deep, but I believe that through this seminar, God is going to do a healing 
God's going to heal the brokenhearted. He's going to bind up the wounds. In other words, because we all have situations that we live in right now. And sometimes we'll, it can be whether a husband or a wife or it can be a relationship. It can be a brother or a sister in Christ. Whatever it may be, mother and father, whatever relationship it is. That you can be affected and I can even say the word infected by the negativity of people in your life that can cause these wounds and can cause you to react rather than respond. There's a difference between reacting and responding. When you react, it's right off the bat. When you respond, it's because you've taken a moment to think about what you're going to say. In fact, God's word says, every idle word that man will speak will give an account to. Some of us have had emotional abuse. Some of us have had physical abuse. Some of us that may be watching the seminar, the very same thing. And that has caused scars and has caused a way of your personality being formed around those hurts and those pains. So what ends up happening is it affects your personality because you begin to say things and do things that in your conscience and in your heart you know you should have never done, never said. But they just come out. They attack. And, and we're going to get into all of that, why that happens. Because a lot of times... Um, we sometimes think we've forgiven, but we haven't. And I can give you one illustration of that, and it was with Linda. We had a pastor, and he really treated us pretty bad. And we left the ministry, and um, we had gone to another church, and we, it's been, it was several years after, right? It was a couple of years after that. We were sitting in a church, and this preacher was preaching, and he was preaching on forgiveness. And I give my wife the elbow, you know. I said, yeah. she goes, I don't have any unforgiveness. And she really believed this. She really believed she didn't have this un any unforgiveness. She thought her conscience was clear, you know. But subconsciously, there was something hidden there. And so a couple of weeks would go by, another message would be given and mention forgiveness. I give her the elbow. She said, what? I don't have any unforgiveness. And then it came a time when we had to re get res restoration with this pastor. And uh, we had set up a meeting. And I told Linda, I said, Linda, I says, we can't go with any unforgiveness in the heart. She goes, I don't have any unforgiveness. I said, okay, will you pray with me at least? And she said, yes. So I led her in a prayer of forgiveness. And when it got to the point where she repeated, I forgive him, she said, it felt like somebody grabbed my throat and squeezed. She said, I couldn't. She was like, ah. And then she let it out and she just burst out in tears. God did a healing there. She didn't even know it. She wasn't trying to hide it. She wasn't trying to, you know, you know, say, oh, I don't have forgiveness. But really inside she knew she had unforgiveness. She didn't know. And sometimes because of the wounds and the, and the hurts that have gone through in life, they can cause these deep-seated subconscious things in our subconscious. I want you to go to the next slide for me, please. No, that's not the one. It's not there? <sighs> well, let me give you a disclaimer medically, okay? I'm not a doctor. Don't pretend to be a doctor. The seminar is not to diagnose any kind of problems that you may have. And we encourage you not to stop taking any medication. 
So I want to make that clear as a disclaimer. It's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be recorded. It's being recorded that we're not a doctor. We're not practicing medicine here. We're not asking you to practice medicine, okay? That we encourage you to, to have you know, whatever doctors you go to, go whatever medication you're on, you still take your medication. Don't do st stupid stuff. Don't stop taking your medication. Be under the advisement of your doctor. Amen? God uses doctors. Luke was a doctor. Hello, who wrote the book of Luke, okay? So don't, don't do that. So that's the disclaimer we're putting up here first. Now, go to that first uh, slide there. Is that the one with the psalm on it? Okay, get it? Okay. Okay, just wait for me, okay? Okay, just wait for me. In Psalm 34, 18, I'm not going to put them up on the screen. You're going to have to look these up. And the reason why I did that is because we have a tendency to become lazy. It's up on the screen, don't have to do anything, you know. If you have a Bible and somebody doesn't have a Bible, share it with them. Sit next to them. Show it to them, okay? Um, Psalm 34, 18 says this. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. See, I can tell you these truths and I can convey them to you, but you have to believe them. So in this seminar, as we get into this, get into things, we're going to get into a, a quite a few things that is going to cause you to do some things. It's going to cause you to look in your heart and look into your soul and examine yourself because I do believe, and the material I'll be taking is from Art Matthias. He's up in uh, Alaska. He's a PhD. Uh, he had, listen to this, he had 32 environmental allergies. 32. You say, what's an environmental allergy? Well, an, an environmental allergy is you have an allergy to the sun. You have an allergy to clothing, certain cloths. You can't wear them. You can't go outside certain times, the weather, all kinds of things. So he had 32 of these allergies. And I'm just going to give you a little testimony of what he went through. So he lived most of his life not enjoying the outdoors, can't wear certain clothes, had some allergies to foods, so many different allergies, 32, okay? And what ended up happening one day is he had a guest minister coming to his church. It was a friend of his, and he was staying in his home with him, if I'm getting the story correctly. And um, his friend said to him one day, he said, Ah, he said, um, do you have any unforgiveness towards somebody? So I felt like the Spirit of the Lord is telling me you have unforgiveness. He said, I'm a psychologist. I'm a Christian psychologist, a Christian counselor. Don't you think I'd know if I had any unforgiveness to anybody? He says, no, I'm fine. I said, okay. So a couple of days later, his friend says to him, you know, the Lord's really impressing that on my heart. Can we pray together? And he said, yeah. So I, I'm trying to remember the whole story. And so I believe they prayed together. And God showed him that he had unforgiveness towards somebody for 20 years. So he said, will you pray with me? He said, I can't believe that. I said, I forgot all about that. He said, that person did something to you? And he said, yeah. He said, you never released him? He said, no. So he said, let's pray. So they prayed. He was released. You know what happened? He was healed of all 32 allergies. There is doctrinal studies right now that can convey and can tell us that people who suffer with stress have physical ailments. As a man thinketh, so is he. 
I remember when my mother-in-law passed away. And her brother at the funeral parlor said these words. Remember? I'm next. And he was. See, so you, you have to understand that words can open the door for the enemy in your life. And so there's going to be three things that I'm going to ask of you in the seminar that we're going to be giving you, okay? Those who are watching by Facebook Live, or maybe you'll go back and look at it later. There's three things that you and I, we must have in order to see this to be effective in our, in our life. Number one, you've got to have courage. You've got to have courage. Hallelujah. What is courage? Courage is the choice and willingness to confront agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. That's what courage is. And I'm not asking you to have courage toward anyone with any one situation. I'm asking you to have courage to face yourself. To have the courage to examine yourselves and see if maybe sometimes there are things that you suffer is because of some deep-rooted spiritual situation. Number two, strength. The quality of our state of being strong. What happens when you are in a situation where there is intimidation or danger or pain or uncertainty, there's two chemicals released in your body, fight or flight. When you're faced with something, you either face it and fight it or you run. One of those two things happen. You either fight, the adrenaline that rushes through your body, you either fight or you flight. Examine that through your life and see how many times have you said these words. Whatever. I'm not dealing with that. Huh? And you walked away. That's the flight. But the courage of the fight is to not run away from the, those things that have happened to you, but to face them, especially as a Christian, to face them and to know that you're not alone, that you've got somebody more powerful living inside of you, willing to help you, willing to comfort you, willing to strengthen you, willing to heal the brokenheartedness that you had. And believe me, if these things are not taken care of, it will affect relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship, not only with humans, but also with God. You take that in the natural sense of, of a family, a father and a mother, and the father leaves. There's no father in the family. That brings emotional stress. So all of these things, if we're willing to do these things and, and face these things, can bring much healing. So number one, we have to have courage. Number two, we have to have strength. And number three is one of the most important things. You've got to have truthfulness. 
our honesty. You've got to be honest with yourself. How many times you have walked into a place and you've seen a friend and, and at first they're faced, it seems like there's something really wrong and you walk up and then they see you and a, a little smirk comes on their face and they go, oh, hi. And you go, how's everything? And they go, oh, it's fine. That's because they're running. They don't want to deal with that issue. They don't want you to know what's really happening in their life. They don't want you to know. And we've done that too. Something happens, we get embarrassed, we get ashamed. And so rather than facing the issue, we run away from it. Or we try to hide it, we try to cover it and, you know, make it so that people will not know. You've got to be honest with yourself. When you do an evaluation, because God deals in truth, God deals with honesty. And if we're not honest with ourselves, we're only fooling ourselves. And God's saying, no, we've got to go back. We've, there's things in our, in our hearts and in our lives that, you know, we probably said things or done things or we were rough with somebody or we said something wrong or we said the right thing the wrong way. And it's damaging our emotions. I've said this a few years ago. People don't like change. They don't like to change. But God wants us to change. But you can't change, and I can't change, if we continue doing the same thing over and over again. That's not how it change comes. We're going to talk more about that. Isaiah 61.1 says this. It was a prophecy that Isaiah was giving. You can find it in the book of Luke 2. I think it's chapter 4. But where it says, The Spirit of the Lord... is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me. So we see, first and foremost, it's a prophecy that's being fulfilled when Jesus is speaking this in the synagogue. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, meaning Jesus, because the Lord hath anointed me to what? Preach bad news? <laughs> Can I inform you that God already knows all about your bad news? <laughs> so he doesn't have to be informed of the bad news. He knows that man that we are of dust. He knows our sinful nature. He knows about it. He, he was there in the garden when Adam fell and Eve fell. He knows what took place and what Adam lost. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me. This is, this is a divine mandate that God gave to Jesus. He said, he sent me to what? To bind up the broken hearted. Bind up the broken hearted. How many here ever had their heart broken? How'd you fix it? Come on, how'd you fix it? You just some of them harden their hearts even more. Someone gets hurt loving somebody, what's the words that come out of their mouth? I'll never love them again. Somebody breaks a trust, I'll never trust that person again. I'll never trust people again. What ends up happening? You begin to harden your heart. 
or you just forget about it. You just tuck it away in your subconscious. You don't deal with it anymore. But yet, in every relationship you have, it affects that relationship. <clears throat> We're going to get into the reasons why next week, <clears throat> but not this week. To bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. <clears throat> that means whatever's going on inside of us has cap cap put us in captivity. You can't be the real person that God created you to be. I remember Linda and I, when we first got married, I don't, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven years, whatever it was. We've been married, all, this April will be 35 years. And I remember one time I had done something which I can occasionally do on times to aggravate Linda. And um, she was kind of angry. She started telling me all the things that I'd done. And I would say some things, and then I started thinking about it, and then I, I, said to the, I said to her, I said, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how would you like it if God pulled out your file cabinet and opened up that thing and told you about everything that you had done rather than forgiving and forgetting it and letting it go? And she said, you know, you're right. And from that day, she's never done it again. Huh? And we don't go back and pick out what's... But see, people will do that when there's still hurts, there's still pain, there's still deep, deep wounds. They'll still do that. They'll go back in that file cabinet, and they'll pull that drawer out, and they'll say, see, I got the proof. Look what you did. You did this, you did this, you did this. Do you know what I'm talking about? Huh? Come on. You have to burn that file cabinet. But until you be able to deal with those issues. I, I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive her. And guess what? You'll never be set free. You'll be in captivity in your mind and in your heart and even in your body until you deal with these issues. And it doesn't have to be that you were beat up. It could be simple things. What does the Bible say in Proverbs? Yea, there's six things the Lord hates, seven. What's one of them? Pride. Pride. A lying tongue. I told a pastor one time, we were having a conversation, and I told him, I said, listen, I said, if your house ain't in order, you have no business being behind a pulpit preaching. If a wife doesn't know how to treat her husband and the husband doesn't know how to treat her, the wife, there's always going to be a wall up. There's always going to be strife, arguments. I mean, Linda and I, we have fun. The other night, I'm in bed, you know, and we went to bed at about 9.30, you know. And I get under the covers, you know, and I got the covers up to here, you know, like this. She gets in bed, and man, she was almost, she's about ready to hang me. She pulled those curtains, I mean, the, the, that, those blankets, and I was like, Wah! So I, I have a new nickname for her. I call her Hang em High. Yeah. And she laughed and laughed. I mean, really, I, I think George might have thought we were crazy. And I was laughing and she was laughing because the success of our marriage has been this. You forgive and, you, and be a friend and you love that person. Those things are the things that will cement a relationship. That it's, It doesn't matter. I don't have to prove my point. 
You didn't do this. You didn't do that. See, I told you. What good is that going to do? You know what that does? That closes the person's heart even more and more and more. Because our words, like the Bible says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. You can kill a person's spirit, their ambition, and what they want to accomplish in life simply by your little tongue. To, bring, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. When we understand that God is in the healing business. He's in the business of good news. Good news. What's the good news? That God loves you. He cares about you. He wants to be interactive in your life every day. He wants you to acknowledge him. He wants you to put him first. Because I'm going to tell you something. He'll be the first one there when you're in trouble. He'll be the first one there to comfort you in your sorrow. He'll be the first one there to never leave you nor forsake you. Your friends will forsake you. Trust me. When I was living in the world and I had money, I had friends. Really. It was like throwing popcorn to a pigeon, man. You throw that popcorn out there, they all come flying around. You have plenty of friends when you got money. But when you don't have money, where are your friends? Where are they? When they hear you got money, you got cousins, aunties, uncles that you never knew about. Knocking on your door, hey, I need some money. Huh? Come on, that's the truth. I'm telling you the truth, right? You haven't heard from them in 10 years. Then they find out you got a hold of some money. There they are on your door, man, knocking on your door. Hi, how are you? Oh, I missed you. <laughs> we have to be careful not to be so hardened and think that we've arrived because we've been in this thing for 30, 40 years or 20 years or whatever it may be. No. We're moving on to perfection. But in order to move on, as I said from the very beginning, as we started out on the introduction of this, this seminar, is this. Is that you have to have courage. Come on. You've got to have truthfulness and honesty. And what else? And strength. You've got to have the strength to be able to look in the mirror and see your own flaws, your own shortcomings, and say, Lord, how do I change it? How do I become better instead of bitter? We're going to talk about all of these things next week. We're going to talk about bitterness. Some people don't even know that they're bitter towards somebody or a resentfulness, and how it progresses, the stage of progression that can happen. Because it happens to each and every one. We're all involved in life. And we rub elbows with unsaved people. We rub elbows with some Christians sometimes that rub, rub us the wrong way. See, I have to love you, but I don't have to hang around you. <laughs> But I have to love you. And that's an unconditional love. Regardless of how you treat me, I still have to love you. That's one of the hardest things to do when we try to love in our own strength rather than listening and allowing the love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts, the Bible says, and allowing that love to come forward. But if you've got all this junk inside... It's like barriers, and that love can't come out. 
It's always hitting the barrier, always hitting the barrier, always hitting the barrier until we get things right. And sometimes it may mean that you have to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness. Sometimes it may mean that if you can't see them face to face, you might have to write them a letter to make things right. Regardless of their reaction to that. Your obedience doesn't come in thinking, well, they're not going to receive it, so therefore I'm not going to do it. No. You do it anyway. Whether they receive it or not. Why? So that you can be free. I can be free. Is this helping anybody? We have to change our thinking also as a church. Now, there are people that are going to play you. There's people going to play games. That's just the way it is. But we still got to help them. We still got to pray for them. Even though some people aggravate us to no end. Now, don't tell me you don't get aggravated as a Christian. We all do. We get upset. But it's how you handle that and what you do after that. That is the, the thing that matters. That's what God looks at. He knows that we're dust. He knows we're going to fail. He knows that. But it's what do we do with it after that? I shared this many years ago. Uh, I, maybe it was even recently. I don't remember. Maybe like when I say recently, last year or the year before. There's three things that you've got to do. Number one, you've got to find out where your information base is coming from. Your information base can be people, your husband, your wife, relationships, your children, your ex, if you're still in communication with your ex, Whatever. That's an information base. Father, mother, sisters, brothers. That's your information base. What do I mean? I'll give you an example. You grow up in your home, and your mom or your dad, they're always telling you, you're no good. Why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? You're always messing up. You're always doing something wrong. You're never going to amount to anything. You're useless. Sound familiar? I've heard that. I don't blame my father. He had a sixth grade education. He didn't know any better. He, his father died when he was real, real, real young. He didn't have a father figure. He had a mother. Now, this was way back in the 40s, okay? 30s, 40s, okay? And she would bring men home. And he saw that back then. So he didn't know any better. And I didn't understand that until I became a Christian. And I really didn't understand that until I was sitting with him on his deathbed. And God revealed it to me. But see, I was a very shy person. I'd get embarrassed at the drop of a hat. I remember being little, and they had a New Year's party at my house. I was maybe 10. And my dad called me downstairs and says, sing for us. He had a few, you know. I was so embarrassed. I ran. I ran upstairs. I was so shy. You say, you, pastor? 
Yeah. I was very timid. Until I got saved, got the Holy Ghost, <laughs> and then it, my whole life changed. I, I mean, in the world, I didn't. When I wasn't a Christian, I had Seagram Seven and Seven. That's what made me brave. That's when I could face up on the platform and play music and yell and scream and joke around and. But take that away? No. Very, very timid, very shy. But thank God I don't need Seagram 7 anymore. I've got the Holy Ghost. And so that's the difference. You've got to change your information base. You have to. If you don't change your information base, and you need to stop believing in which, in whom those that information comes from, because they could be speaking things into your life, and they're not true. People can say things to you, call you names, say things to you, and it not be true. But if you believe it, that's where the power comes from. It comes from what you believe if that person is telling you. So you have an information base. But now you're a Christian. Right? Saved. Where's your information base? In order for you to see change, you've got to change your information base to your operation base. How you operate. This says, whoever they may be, you'll never amount to anything. Your life is worthless. This information base says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I know the plans that I have towards you, plans of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. What information base are you going to believe? If you believe this one, you'll never change. And that's where the deception is because people think, well, I'll change, but they don't change the information base. They keep believing that same information base, and they're expecting a different result. That's the definition of insanity. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's what insanity is. You have to change your information base to change your operation base to get a different result. You can't not have an operation base and just think, well, I'm going to go from here to here. It won't work. Or I'm going to go from here to here. It won't work. You've got to change your information base. When God's word says that he has given you power over scorpions and serpents, do you believe that? Do you believe that he says when you stop fighting battles to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Why does he say to do that? Because you have an enemy that is accuser of the brethren and the, and the sisters. Day and night, he's there accusing you. Oh, see, you didn't do that. Oh, see, you didn't do this. Oh, you didn't do that. Oh, oh you, look, at, look, at, look at how you responded. Oh, always accusing us. But Jesus... If the information base that Jesus gives us is, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we change the information base rather than looking at that and saying, oh, I failed, I'm no good, uh, I'm never going to amount to anything in Christ, I'm not going to do anything, oh, woe is me. You'll always be that way. You'll never change. The only way you change is change the information base. So this is all part of the introduction of what we're going to get into. We're going to get into some 
real specific areas next week. Okay, that's going to help us to understand, maybe have a few illustrations of, of things, of how to deal with some of these feelings and these emotions that we bury inside of us. How, how many times have you ever said something and then regretted it after? Right? We've said it. We've said something to our, 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 our sister or a brother or an auntie or an uncle or a mother or a father. And, and we regretted it after. And then go out and do the same thing again. Go out and do the same thing again. Go out and do the same thing again. That's because we're not changing the information base. Amen? We've got to change the information base of what God thinks. <clears throat> Knowing that God will take care of us, that we don't have to have that flight that adrenaline of flight running from God. We're going to get into that next week. But the first thing is you've got to believe is that God is for you, not against you. Isn't that what the Bible says? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the information base. When you go through something, uh, you somebody says something or does something. Um, I was listening to uh, B.H. Clendenin. If you can ever, I put it on Facebook. I don't know if anybody saw the message there. It's, it's about worldliness and about li uh, hating the world. He said that him and a friend, when they were starting out in ministry, they would go to the cities and they would begin to preach out in the open, you know, out in the open spaces and stuff like that. And he was preaching about hell. And this police officer was on a motorcycle, and he showed up. And every time the preacher would speak, he'd rev up the, mic the motorcycle, trying to interrupt the meeting. And then finally, after, after he was done doing that, he went like this, I have a question. The preacher said, okay, what is it? He said, how far is hell? Preacher said it's right around the corner. That police officer left on his motorcycle, went around the corner, got hit by an 18-wheeler and died. What I'm saying to you is this, is that God is on your side. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. You've got to believe that. You don't have to fight God's battle for him. You know, if we, we used to sing that song, If I hold my peace, then the Lord will fight my battle. Victory, victory, it is mine. Sometimes it's even best to walk away. And sometimes we need healing. We need to be healed. Amen? We need to go to God and say, God, this irritation or this thing that's in my life, uh, this thing, I, I need healing, God. And where are you going to find that? Where are you going to find that? Through a Christian psychologist? You know, you have to peel away the banana. You have to peel the peels away to get to the banana. He might be able to do that for you, or a Christian counselor. Well, you know where your healing is going to come from? Right here. You get down on your knees. You cry out with sincerity to God. You say, God, I've been through a lot in my life. I've gone through hurts that nobody knows about things that were said to me that hurt me deeply and caused wounds in my spirit. But can I tell you, this is the place right here. It's not the preacher. It's not a psychologist. It's not a, a Christian counselor. It's right here at the altar. When you bow your knee to God and you come up here and you just cry out to God and say, God, 
Change me. Change my heart, O God. Make me ever new. Change my life, O God. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. That's what God is doing right now. He's molding us and making us. However, some clay is not really pliable. Mm -hmm. You know, we get stiff on God. We want, God wants to do something. We get a little stiff with him, and he, he's kind of like, no, <laughs> you're on the wheel. Ever been there? Ever been on the wheel? Not, it doesn't feel good. I was on the wheel this morning. And I was saying, God, you've got to change some things in me. You know, sometimes I want to knock somebody's head off. You know, but that's me. God says, no, you can't do that. I mean, I don't think there's anybody perfect here, right? Including from here, from here down, there's nobody perfect. We're not always right. Nobody's always right. But again, we need to change the information base, which will change the operation base, which means we get a different result. Amen? And that's what we strive for. And that's what we want to see. Next week, we're going to get into some real specific areas and talk about some of these things. And please, please, don't flight. Don't not come. Come. Let God deal with your heart. Let God deal with those issues that have been, you know, plaguing you for years and years. Some of you, some of you have been so hard, very reactive, mean, mean-spirited. God says, no, I don't want you that way. I didn't create you to be that way. Because deep down inside, deep down, Deep down, he's begun to work. Sometimes that work has got clogged up with all kinds of junk. And we need to get that removed. When you need junk removed, you call the junk man. And he comes and he cleans out your basement, he cleans out your attic. That's what God does. He cleans out your basement, which is your spirit, and your attic, which is in your head and your thoughts. And sometimes there's cobwebs up there. Sometimes we, we don't know which way to turn. Sometimes there's things that are going on in our life where we say, God, why am I going through this? Well, you know what? Sometimes it's because we didn't listen. We didn't listen to what he said. We went our own way. Like the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to their own way. And that's the truth. But I believe that God wants to do a healing I want you to tell your friends about this seminar, some that you may know that are going through a tough time right now. Bring them. Let them come. Let them get healed. Let them know that they don't have to be a prisoner in, a, in captivity to those feelings and those, those emotions and those outbursts. They don't have to be that way anymore. God has a plan. He has a better plan. And his plan is so that you can have peace. You can develop a loving relationship. You can d develop friendships and and some people, I'm sorry to say, some people that I know, they isolate themselves. You know why they do that? Because they don't love themselves. They look at themselves and they, they think they're, that they, they, nobody wants to listen to them or talk to them or, or they don't want to be around people because people will make fun of them. It's crazy. But that's how some people think. But we all have special gifts and talents that God has given us to share with the body of Christ. And God loves you, and he loves me. He loves them that are watching by Facebook. And even Sister Linda, way up in Maine, if you're watching me tonight, I know you've been through some hurts and some pains in your life, and there have been people that have hurt you. And God is saying, it's coming. Release is coming. Release is coming to you. You just hold on. God's got some special things for you, Sister Linda. And others that are watching, and those that are here this, this evening. So I'm going to close this session of introduction, and next week we're going to start getting into some of the meat of this. 
And uh, I don't know how long it'll go, maybe two, three weeks, four weeks, I don't know, we'll see. But um, what, I, what I'd like you to do is, is, is when you leave this place, just take a few moments to say, God, God, I want to I want I want to be all that you have for me. I want to be able to serve you the way that I'm supposed to serve you. And God, I want you to begin to reveal to me. Open my heart, Lord. Let my let my heart be in the light of who you are and begin to expose anything that's not of you, God. And uh let's see what God does. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, that you are doing some great things. And I believe that, God, that you're going to heal the brokenhearted. You're going to set at liberty those that are captive. And you're going to set the prisoners free. I know the enemy doesn't want this. He wants to see us all bound up. He wants to see us struggling. He wants to see us fighting with one another. But, God, that's not your, way, your will or your way. So, Lord, I ask you to be with your people today. And I pray that this information that has gone forth in this introduction has been a help. And, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to speak these things. Now, be with us as we go our separate ways, and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.